Hey, welcome to the channel. My name is Jason and here I talk about all things story. And the story I'm talking about today is one of my own. It is episode 31 of Worth 1000 Words, a series where I write a 1000 word short story based on a piece of artwork without an outline. But before we move on, I have another short story of more than 1000 words that you might like to check out. It is my latest fantasy adventure called Forged of Ice and Blood. It is about 8,000 words, so um, a good eight times longer than these stories you usually listen to or read. And all the proceeds are going to a great cause, a charity indefinitely. So I encourage you to pick up uh, an ebook, they're $2.99, or a paperback, which is $6.99. And speaking of that, if you'd rather uh, read the story instead of hear me read it to you, um, I've started to post these on my Instagram, so you can check me out at Jason W. Furman or always on my site at jasonferman.com. I post it there um, as soon as I, um, well, usually as soon as I release the video. And don't forget, if you want to skip around, I have chapter selections because I'm sure uh, not all of you want to watch every little bit of this. I know they're longer videos, but that is enough of that. Let's talk about the music. Let's talk about the soundtrack of the story. Well, this story delves deep into metaphor and subtext and symbolism. So I needed something that was immersive, atmospheric, and, and fit the tone of the art. And I know you haven't seen the art yet, but I think this audio choice will, will make a lot of sense once you do. It is by one of my favorite instrumental bands, uh, A Winged Victory for the Sullen. It is their latest release that just came out called Invisible Cities. So if you're looking for, for anything to relax to or write to or create to, whatever it is you're doing, I highly recommend you check them out. But without further ado, let's check out this week's artwork. This week's artwork is titled Whale, and it is by a freelance concept artist named Oleg Bulak from Azov, Russia. This one is, is quite a bit different than a lot of ones I pick. Um, it's, it feels more symbolic. It feels more metaphorical. It, it does not feel as if this whale <laughs> or this flying creature is actually there because there's a couple things that um, I noticed. And there's this guy sitting on a rock down there. He looks like he's thinking. I mean, I guess maybe he's looking up at this thing. It's, it's kind of difficult to tell. But through this car, it, it drove up this sheer cliff and it's almost as if he came to this spot to be alone at least that's what i got from it and it looks as if the, the whale itself is being pulled from the clouds so i feel like there's just some deeper meaning going on here and i think that is why i chose this one i, I wanted to try to do something metaphorical something with with some subtext and and see where this one leads so oleg thank you for the artwork i I love the originality and um, let's see what I came up with. Charcoal clouds stagnated outside the window. It was all Nathan could look at, his eyes caught in that wet cement. It only comes out when it storms, Charlie said. Nathan smelled disinfectant and old upholstery. When it storms? Yeah. Why is that? Charlie's lips made air bubbles, what he always did when deep in thought. Hungry for a worm? Nathan said. Charlie didn't laugh. Because it is. The non-answer of a child allowed Nathan to free his gaze from the window. Because? Charlie gathered the stiff sheet under his chin. He shivered, so Nathan took off his jacket and laid it over him, arranging the sleeves to his sides and putting the collar just below Charlie's head. The backward kid is my favorite. Nathan said. Still, Charlie didn't laugh. Because it's cold. Does it like the cold? No. Then why wouldn't it come out when it's sunny? Because it's made of the storm. It's sunny on the inside, though. That's where it hides the sun. Why would it hide the sun? The sun is its heart. Nathan touched Charlie's hand through the sheet. That makes sense. If I were made of storm clouds, I'd like to keep the sun too. It's very cold. Should I bring my jacket? No, yours won't fit. I mean, for me, when I go see this flying whale, why does it fly anyway? Charlie shrugged. It just does. Will you come with me? Charlie looked at the ceiling through it. 
His skin was a good color, warm tones. His lips weren't chapped. His eyes were clear. I can't, Charlie said. I know. I don't want to go if you can't come with me. You have to. Why? Because the whale will be sad. It's lonely up there. It's the only one? Yes. Then I'll go. Charlie's lips were pressed together and his eyes were glassed. Is it a boy or a girl? Neither. It's the only one. I see. The window appeared to confine the clouds. They bunched into colorless gobs. Where's mom? Charlie said. Sobbing in the hallway, glued to the bench with a swollen face she couldn't bear for Charlie to see. She went to get a surprise for you. That didn't garner a smile, no change in pulse, and Nathan knew because he held Charlie's wrist. Weak blips. She's been gone a long time, Charlie said. I know. I'm hot, Charlie said. You sure? A nod. Nathan took his jacket back and laid it on his lap, and when he felt the warmth, smelled Charlie on it, he put it on. Are you cold? Charlie said, sweating a furnace. Yes, Nathan said. Sorry. Nathan almost lost it then, seeing his son there, sorry for something that he had no reason to be sorry for. The bed slowly swallowing him, no matter how hard Nathan held on, with his hands, his mind, his heart. It's not your fault, Nathan said. Those words broke him, and he turned away from Charlie. You don't have to be sad. I don't want to, but I can't help it. Well, you should be happy, Nathan wiped his nose. No, I, I shouldn't. You should, because you can't both be sad. It's lonely. It needs you to be happy. I haven't told anyone else where to find it. Just you. So you have to be happy. You have to. Nathan had never known such pain as smiling in this moment. It burned with a hot and cold. And if it weren't for Charlie's tranquil expression, he might have believed his mouth was bleeding. All right, Nathan said. The clouds had lowered on the horizon, reaching rooftops, building, collecting, so much pressure the sky would burst. Charlie smiled with his teeth, one of those fake kid smiles but not fake at all. His eyelids drooped. Are you ready to see it now? No. Nathan furiously wiped his eyes. He wouldn't let himself see his son in any way but with crystal clarity. It's ready for you. It, it told me. Tell it I'm not ready. I can. I, th I think you can. Please. For me. He's waiting. He? I, I thought you said... Charlie lay still, peaceful, healthy to anyone who didn't know. Nathan fumbled with his phone to take a picture because Charlie looked so alive, and he wanted to have that forever. He knew his memory would make mistakes, leave out details, twist the image into something it wasn't. Instead, he threw his phone across the room, disgusted by the thought. He stormed down the hall, the bench absent of his wife, and he didn't care. The parking lot was a wind tunnel. People hurried in from the coming storm with inverted umbrellas. Not Nathan. He got in his car, weaved through traffic, barreled through red lights, the honks of horns, gnats buzzing around his head. Soon he was on the highway, chasing the storm. Its belly sagged to mountaintops, fin-like wisps breaking free, to where Charlie had instructed. His car wasn't meant for off-road, but he took it off-road anyway, the cab jostling and making sounds of destruction. A windy, rocky road led to the darkest and fattest clouds, and he sped toward them, hoping the top ended in a sheer cliff and that would be that. It didn't. A plateau was where he found himself, flat and broad and safe. He exited the car, faced the wind, and when he couldn't face it anymore, he sat. The clouds were so close he could almost touch them. 
He tried. There was no depth. The sky was a nothingness. And then it showed itself, the whale. It split from the storm in a caress, coasted down to where Nathan sat. Close, but out of reach. Two fissures opened up along its belly, showing him the sun it had captured, the heart it would share, and that it would keep him warm because the storm was cold. Like Nathan, who took in the sight with tears the wind wouldn't let him have. The first thing that came to mind is <laughs> the loss of a child. And I know that is cliche and uh, somebody out there called me out on it. So congratulations, you are right. You guessed correctly what I was going to do. But as I said, when I was describing the art, this guy looks like he's not so much paying attention to this thing flying over his head. He's, he's contemplative. He's thinking about something. He's reminiscing. He's something, right? And he, why did he drive up to this sheer cliff? I don't know. It feels weird. This, this whole thing felt like a metaphor to me, symbolic. It didn't feel like this was actually happening. One other thing I wanted to do is I wanted to make this thing very dialogue heavy. A friend of mine and, and really great author, Jason Gurley, a lot of the stuff I've read of his was kind of this ping pong back and forth dialogue, meaning uh, short statements and, and responses. And, and really what that allows you to do is it allows sort of the, the space between the words to speak which is where the subtext lies. And so you can see here, I'm talking about, it only comes out when it storms. When it storms, yeah, why is that? So these really short, almost like small talk statements, and I know they seem ordinary, but really there's, there's more to it. There's this sense of trying to fill the spaces of silence, because that's what happens, you know, when, when people don't have much to talk about, um, but they're afraid of the awkward silences, they keep talking and unless they are engaged in some kind of topic this is what you get but it goes a little bit deeper because he's talking about his child or he's talking to his child nathan and you can see here that he's trying to cheer him up calling him backward kid because he he put his jacket on top and the back is facing up trying to do anything to lift his spirits and I did foreshadow or I did set the stage with the first line talking about the storm outside. And I think here, uh, I haven't established what it is they're talking about, but you know, it's, it's kind of this childlike thing. So, you know, why would it hide the sun? We can already tell that this is very imaginary. Really, I, I hope that I captured this conversation between a son and his child, uh, two people who know exactly what's going to happen, who knows the situation they're in, how they are unable to do anything to stop it. And this is their conversation. They're trying to just kind of just get away from reality, essentially. And we're getting a little bit deeper here. The dad, you know, wants him to come and he, they're starting to address the actual problem, the elephant in the room. And I think right now in the dialogue that the, the, the kid is, is actually a little bit more mature and, and at peace with what is to become of him, just in the responses. It's almost as if the, the child and parent have, have switched roles to a degree. We have the father who is, is saying hopeful things or, you know, asking his son, you know, are you going to come with me? He knows he's not going to come with him, but he does it anyway. It's almost just like this ignorant last hope. But here we switch back to roles. We have uh, Charlie asking where his mother is and uh, a brief kind of internal description of where she is and the dad's answer, his response is, she went to get a surprise for you. So he's avoiding it completely. He's just, you know, buying the mother some time. She's not going to come in. She can't handle what's going to happen. And I think my one regret in this story is maybe, uh, I, maybe I was a little too literal. You know, you can clearly figure it out what's happening. I was inspired uh, by a Hemingway story called Hill, I think it's Hills of White Elephants. I'll put an image up here because I, I forget. But the entire story is about this conversation um, between a man and a woman. And it's, <laughs> it's about what they're going through, but they're not being literal with their words. It's all about subtext. It's all about symbolism. And essentially, that's what I was trying to do here. And the funny thing is, is I, I heard about it on a podcast and then I ended up reading it. And when I read it, I didn't get that 
I didn't get the actual meaning out of it whatsoever. So I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing because it was just seeped in, seeped in so much subtext and that you never really gleaned what the story was really about. Whereas here in this one, I do get literal. You can tell people are sad. You can, you understand there's, there's words used like healthy and strong. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty obvious he's in a, he's in a hospital room or, or some kind of uh, bedroom with a, with a hints of disinfectant and old upholstery. So I, I don't know. It's one of those things where, uh, you can play with the, the art of writing and, and try to figure out if, if you can create a story that people will get at some point, the true meaning of, but, but not give it away in any kind of literal sense. Or you can do the, the take that I did where it's, I wouldn't say it's like crazy literal. I never mentioned hospital. I never mention sickness or, or, or anything like that. But I still think it's it's fairly easy to understand what's going on. So I don't know. Writing is all about communication. Um, I know it's an art, but you know if your message is lost to the reader, then I imagine you failed. So maybe it's somewhere in the middle of this and and what Hemingway did, because I'm sure all readers want to know the true meaning of a story, or at least uh, seed enough information to uh, have the reader guess at the at the very least, or give them little clues that's that something is is not quite what it seems it's been a while since i've read the hemingway story so i'm not sure how i'd feel about it now i should probably go back and read it i should probably do that right after this to see if um i pick up any hints and finally uh we're getting toward the end i'm at 700 words a little over and we can see that nathan's sad and um you know the boy is saying it's ready for you it told me meaning you know he's ready to die obviously and the dad is fighting back. Tell it I'm not ready. I can't. And then, you know, I think you can, please, for me. And so it's this it's this moment where the child is just succumbing to death. He's accepting it. Um, he's but he's not fighting. It's not a grisly death. It's it's not it's just this peaceful moment between two people. And, you know, maybe the storm outside was a little bit too on the nose, but it looks like it's storming in the image. So that was <laughs> that was the inspiration there. And so here's what I was talking about, the literal. So, you know, he's, he's, he's still, he's perfect. He's unblemished, he's healthy to anyone who didn't know. So that's enough indication as to what's going, you know, because Charlie looks so alive and he wanted to have that forever. So maybe that's the literal part of it right there. But, you know, once again, I, I wanted someone to read this and understand what's happening and, and not be too confusing with it, not be too cryptic. And so I need to race toward the end. And, and what was nice here is that I think that I captured, at least in my opinion, the, the meat of it as there's a longer form. And so the pacing kicks up quite a bit here uh, toward the end because I'm really running out of words very quickly. And this part doesn't really matter, right? The, the part that mattered is, is the conversation between the father and the son. The journey to this place isn't what matters. And so um, thankfully... With the constraints of the word count, I'm able to uh, speed it along, like out of necessity. But I think the story is better for it. And once again, that's that's why these things are very helpful. Giving yourself an arbitrary word count limit to create something within it it helps you understand uh, structure, pacing, everything. Like uh, just how to uh, break your novel or your your story up into logical pieces um, because they're much smaller pieces. You know, it's it's difficult dealing with a hundred thousand word manuscript and and trying to look at it from a 30,000 foot view and understanding uh, what the proportions are. Whereas something with a thousand words, it's extremely easy to do. You can, you can identify the act breaks. You can identify where the midpoint is, where the story shifts to the resolution, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're not writing short stories, highly recommend it. But like I said, don't, don't just write to any number, whatever the story feels like, write to a very specific number or a range of numbers. And so we have the, uh, the whale, it's, it's chest is opening and, and I've gone over 30 words. And even though a lot of this dialogue is very, um, you know, on the surface meaningless, I need it because I want to create that tempo, that one, two, one, two, one, two, back and forth, back and forth. You know, it's like these, this father and son are essentially playing a, a slow game of 
of catch with a baseball. And I've always noticed anytime I write dialogue, and I'm, I'm sure you've noticed this as well when you write dialogue, is that you quickly uh, up the word count. It just kind of flows out. I feel like language is is much it flows much quick more quick and, and because you have to have a response than the narrative prose so if you ever need to fill up some space um, make it a dialogue scene now don't I, I i'm not saying make it meaningless dialogue uh there should be meaning to it it shouldn't be just to fill up time but and also um it it, it just helps break it up we read dialogue much more quickly than we do narration so or description or anything like that so uh Think of it that way. Think of think of white space in a story. I'm a big fan of white space. You can, you can see in this one, I, I'm not a huge fan of large paragraphs. I feel like the the eye just kind of, you know, stagnates there, right? It just it locks up. You're just scanning line after line after line, and um, that's not what you want. You want these little hurdles for the eye to jump over and, and to dictate the pacing of the story as well. And it's funny, while I hit this at about an hour, it took me a little bit longer to edit. And I think really I, I was taking chunks out. You can see I was really tightening things up back down to 980, but then getting back up and and balancing those last few words was was a little bit difficult. So even though this one took me longer overall, I'm I'm pretty happy with with how it came out and and uh maybe just needed a little bit more care toward the end, and that's why I ran long on the edit. Sometimes the edits uh, come quickly, sometimes not so quick. And another thing I struggled with here was the, the final line or the final couple of lines. I have something that's placeholder here, but um, you, you'll see that I, I go over a thousand and then back under and just trying to find that balance because first lines and last lines are extremely important in short stories because there are no chapters. There's no chance to reset. There's no chance to... Uh, have another first line because I know everybody focuses on first lines of the first uh, paragraph or, you know, first chapter. I think every line in every chapter or every scene break should be a hook. And uh, with a short story like this, you only have one. I mean, some might argue that every paragraph should be a hook, but you know, we don't want to get too out of hand. And here I, I started playing around with dialogue. I, I tried to say, okay, well, he's going to say something like I'm cold or whatever. I'm like, nah, that's too on the nose. And and so I, I had this image in my head, which I did end up keeping. It's, it's a modified version of what you see here. But I like the idea of someone crying, but essentially the wind is not allowing them to cry because it dries the tears before they're allowed to fall. And that's what I have here. You know, I took in the side with eyes. The wind ride, blah, 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 blah. I, I had a better one. Uh, I finished with a better one, but that's it's the same idea. And you can see me going back and forth and trying to reword it, playing with uh, the last 17 words I have. And I believe I have to go up and down a couple times because I, I'm thinking, okay, well, I can, I can add more here. I can, I can cut more there to allow me to have more space for this line because it's, it is a lot nicer to land closer to a thousand when you finish because then, and, and if you're happy with the last line, because then you know that um, really it's just a matter of sort of tightening up all the sentences. And another thing that's sometimes difficult to know in, in these back and forth dialogues is, do you have the he said or so-and-so said every time? Like, cause, cause really you don't want people to get confused on who's saying what. And, and sometimes you can uh, mitigate that when you have uh, stage direction or you know some kind of action before the dialogue uh, that helps break it up but when you have this back and forth back and forth I think you just need to establish it once and that's pretty much what I did here and then once you've established the response especially because you know there's only two people in the room that it, it allows you to minimize the you know Nathan said Charlie said whoever said yeah here's where I start playing with dialogue and then I decided, no, this is a, uh, I feel like this is a quiet moment. Although, I mean, I think there's a, there's a world where this could have worked or something like that could have worked, but, um, I wasn't happy with it. So I, I chose, chose silence and here I am just, uh, going up above a thousand a little bit, um, trying to once again, okay, well, okay. I'm happy with that last line. How do I remove stuff other places? And there we are. Welcome to the end dear viewer. I'm so glad you made it. 
I know that was a long run. Story ran a little bit longer than I was hoping for. Hopefully I sped it up enough to where you weren't completely bored or maybe you skipped that part altogether. And that's okay because I'm probably gonna repeat myself a little bit here if you wanna know my final thoughts on this story. So the, what was the goal of this story? Well, I wanted to create, as I said, a metaphorical piece. Um, I, I didn't wanna have anything literally said or really literally described that was going to give away what was really happening. And I know I failed there a little bit, but it was one of those things I was wrestling with about communication versus art. Not that art can't be communicative, but as I mentioned the short story by Hemingway, Hills with White Elephants, that was completely indecipherable, at least to me. I heard about it. I didn't know what it was about in terms of what the true meaning was. I read it, still didn't know, read an analysis about it, and then went back and read it again and, and still didn't quite understand. So maybe that's my fault. I'm not going to blame uh, one of the greatest writers of all time on it, but I do need to revisit it. I, I think um, now that I've, I've been delving into writing craft a lot more myself and getting a lot more writing done and a lot more reading done, maybe reading it through that lens will help me out a bit. I don't know. Let me know if you've read it in the comments below and uh, if you understood what the hell was going on. So I wanted to capture that. I wanted it to be a subtext of a, a son and a father. The son, um, who is is dying in a bed. And they're having this conversation about a fantastical creature or situation when, which in essence is the boy, right? It's it's symbolic of, of the boy's passing. And I'm not sure that a uh, a storm-like flying whale is, is, is the right creature to tell a story like this about in a metaphorical way, but that is where it led because I, I don't do any planning uh, before I write these things. And so sometimes I don't know where it's going to go, but at the very least, I, I hope I captured that final image and um, what is going through that guy's head, or at least what appears to be going through that guy's head, because he's in a weird place. Literally, he's, he's up on some uh, rocky mountain and there's this whale just coming out of the sky and he doesn't really seem to be paying attention to it, which is kind of strange. So that's what makes me think that uh, there's something more going on here. But that is the challenge I wanted to uh, give myself is to uh, not look at this artwork and, and do something literal, but do something that had a little bit more depth behind it because that can be quite a challenge and, and really any dialogue you write shouldn't be about what is actually being said. There should be some underlying meaning there. It's all about conflict, it's all about tension, and it's a lot less about giving or receiving information. I know that sounds weird or counterintuitive, but I've read that in many, many books on craft and, and dialogue writing or screenwriting. And when you start to really pay attention to it, especially in movies where you can visualize the body language of these characters and how they're interacting with each other, you can see that that is truly the most powerful way. And another thing I wanted to do is, you know, one of my friends, Jason Gurley, who's, who's a really amazing writer, uh, traditionally published, very successful guy. I remember one of his self-published novels he wrote a long time ago. Um, it was he did it Cormac McCarthy style, where there was there was no dialogue tags whatsoever. So it was it was very difficult to distinguish what was narrative description versus dialogue until you kind of got into it and, and got the feeling of it. And I'm sure you've read Cormac McCarthy, and if you haven't please read Cormac McCarthy, one of the, the greatest living writers. But needless to say, uh, they both get a lot of flack for it. Uh, Jason Gurley does not write that way anymore. He uses dialogue tags because sometimes you just have to go with what's the uh, easiest way to get your message across. And when you break rules like that, you, you run the risk of a lot of uh, negative feedback. But anyway, I'm getting off track. In one of his books, he, he wrote a lot of just back and forth banter. And I really love the pacing of that when you're reading because your eye is just darting down the page. And if you intersperse chunks of narrative description here and there, it's almost like you're, you know, slamming on the gas and slamming on the brake. And it's this, it's this really nice tempo for reading. And, and one thing I can't stress enough is play with white space. Don't always think, don't, don't be so concerned about, Hey, is this where I should break a paragraph? Is this where I should start a paragraph? Is this paragraph too short? A paragraph can be one word. It can be one character. Don't go overboard, you know, use it for effect and don't overuse it. Everything in moderation, right? So anyway, doing that, writing these, these this rapid fire dialogue uh, really upped the word count quite a bit. And it got me there quickly. And, and what I enjoyed about that is how uh, you had kind of this 
slow, even though you're reading it quickly because the dialogue is short, it's kind of this, it's this buildup, right? You're building up to something. And then as soon as this event happens, when Nathan leaves the hospital, it's just like a jet ride to that mountaintop and to see this, this whale coming from the storm. And what I loved about that is it, it really allowed me, or I discovered that um, all of the stuff that really mattered, I spent the most time on. Like the journey from the hospital to his destination, that didn't matter whatsoever. And, and you'll notice that uh, the descriptions there were extremely sparse. There was no interior monologue. There was, there was no, uh, any kind of reflection or, or any kind of indication that I was trying to um, uh, prolong this, this experience. So that's what I learned from that. And um, hopefully you got something out of it. You, you can kind of see either where I succeeded or where I failed and, and maybe how it can influence your own work. That is it for me. I hope you enjoyed the story. I enjoyed writing it um, as much as uh, a stressor it is on me every time I sit down. I know that's just part of the process. And, and once I'm done with it, it's it's very rewarding. And I'm sure you know the feeling if, if you've ever created something and, and just completed it. Uh, just finishing something is such a great feeling. So if you're uh, wallowing in a draft or a piece of artwork, or if you're writing some kind of music, just get to the end. Trust me. And if you'd like to support the channel, uh, give me a thumbs up or subscribe if you like story related content. Check out my live streams. Come hang out with me. I, I live stream usually every uh, Saturday and Sunday. I do writing, but anyone is welcome to come hang out. And, and it's just some time for us to all kind of get some work done together. And I've been uh, posting on Instagram. I, I hate Instagram, but I, I thought I, I wanted to do this experiment where I'd post my stories on there to see if, if maybe that format was conducive to that kind of thing. Cause you know, you have the carousel and I, I was able to format the stories in such a way where I could uh, fit it within the maximum amount of images that Instagram allows. Or you can go to my, my old website um, where I posted as well. And, and Plus other things too, like what I'm working on and what I'm reading. And you can always directly contact me there as well. Oh, and of course, you can check out my books on Amazon. The new one I just released, uh, Forged of Ice and Blood. Or my uh, dark coming of age tale, which I definitely need to figure out how to get a print book out of soon. I need to find the entire cover art. And thanks for watching. Keep reading, keep writing, and I will see you next week. Thanks.